Well, good morning. Uh, today, the City Council will consider, consider the City of Toronto's 2021 operating and capital budgets. The pandemic has created the most challenging budget conditions in the history of the city. And I am proud of the fact that the staff and uh, Councillor Crawford, the budget chief, and myself have taken a careful, considerate approach and that our budget is going to be one that I think matches the unprecedented, unprecedented times in which we find ourselves. This is a responsible budget that does the right thing during these very tough times. It preserves and protects city services that people rely on, including some of the most vulnerable citizens in our city, and it invests more in key areas of impact of COVID-19 across the city. We are making investments where, ex where it exactly makes the most sense in our fight against COVID-19. The budget puts millions of dollars more into Toronto Public Health, $281 million in additional pandemic-related fundings for shelters, $37.5 million more for Toronto Community Housing, and $19 million more for seniors in long-term care, just to cite some examples. The city has never before been faced with a crisis which affected our finances in this way. What that called for was a responsible approach, working together with other governments and avoiding politicizing or polarizing what was always going to be a very difficult financial challenge. The first thing we did again this year was to work very hard to find savings. This is the most difficult budget year in the city's history, as I said, because of the impact of COVID-19. We have worked hard to find those savings. This budget includes $573 million in savings that we have identified, offsets and efficiencies. That's on top of the $500 million in savings, offsets and efficiencies that we found when we had to do so when faced with a financial crisis during 2020 in the wake of COVID-19. Even after finding those savings, this budget preserves services because we know that now is not the time to be cutting services. The budget also recognizes that individuals and businesses simply can't afford significant tax increases at this point in the pandemic and should not be asked to absorb tax increases of that magnitude. I will stand behind that honest belief as I enter today's council meeting. Despite an unprecedented drop in ridership due to the pandemic, this budget continues the full city subsidy to the TTC so that we can continue to offer services on the routes that need it most right now. With this budget, we are also freezing TTC fares this year, again, out of consideration for those who have been living through the pandemic. The capital budget invests $611 million this year alone in 439 capital projects with a climate component. And that's important to note that we're proceeding to make the investments in capital that have a climate component, either increasing climate resilience or addressing GHG emissions so that we are continuing with those investments. And I expect we will be making increased investments in our ravines today once the council meeting is all said and done. This budget continues the investments we have made in the poverty reduction strategy that has led to investments of $282 million in new and enhanced services to support poverty reduction between 2015 and 2020. $282 million between 2015 and 2020 in poverty specific poverty reduction measures. 2021 budget invests $8.1 million in new and enhanced services. So all of the investments from before are carried forward and we're investing $8.1 million in new and enhanced services that have to do with poverty reduction, including expanding eligibility for the fair pass transit pass that is discounted for lower income people and those with uh, differing abilities and so on. Uh, and as well, financing for the city's housing now initiative and eliminating library fines for children. And a lot of people wonder eliminating library fines for children. This has a cost for the library system, which operates on a budget I'll make reference to in a moment. But eliminating children's fines at the Toronto Public Library removes barriers to library access, especially for those who need it the most. So that is something that we're doing on the recommendation of the library board and our professional librarians. And when I mentioned the Toronto Public Library budget, it is another of the areas of the budget where we are making additional investments this year. You should know that there are areas where we've held the line and other areas where the need is greatest, where we've actually 
provided for an increased investment, in this case in the library system, $7.5 million, which represents a 4% increase, that taking place in the most difficult budget year in the history of the city, 4% being well above the rate of inflation. This budget also includes $8 million in additional investments I proposed last week and, and were approved by the Executive Committee in jobs for young people, additional jobs beyond the hundreds we were already providing, mental health supports across the city, uh, low-income internet access, and Main Street businesses. These are all areas uh, at, that, are, that have been affected, obviously, or where the need has been greater because of COVID, and the investments will be confined to the areas hardest hit by COVID across the city. I was proud to bring that proposal forward to the Executive Committee after considerable consultation, and I expect Council will approve those additional investments today in those areas, youth jobs, mental health, internet access, and Main Street business, as well as a proposal which will provide some relief, uh, which will be in front of Council today, some relief for the hard-hit taxi industry. In finalizing this budget today, City Council will confirm our consistent strong message that we need the continued support of the provincial and federal governments in our fight against COVID-19. My work to secure federal and provincial support for the city and, and on behalf of my colleagues in all municipalities across the country uh, in meeting the challenge of both dramatically reduced revenues, things like transit, uh, and the unprecedented costs of uh, responding to the pandemic, that work is underway, has been underway for some time, and will continue after today's meeting. I've been working nonstop, just as I did with considerable success in 2020, to secure federal and provincial support. And as was the case with permanent federal transit funding last week, that work has borne some very welcome fruit, uh, but the challenge still lies before us with respect to the 2021 budget. We did secure over $1.9 billion in pandemic-related funding from federal and provincial partners in 2020, and as this budget makes clear, we will require $649 million in further support in 2021 from the Government of Ontario and the Government of Canada in order to continue to provide services and make needed investments in capital, crucial infrastructure investments that create jobs and build up our city and build up our economy and make sure we're ready for a robust recovery when the pandemic comes to an end. While I'm very grateful to Prime Minister Trudeau and to Premier Ford for the strong support I've received from them personally and from their governments in 2020, the support the City of Toronto has received, I'm going to be relentless on the need for continued support in 2021 because I know the key to a strong recovery, the key to making sure that we finish the fight against COVID-19, and the key to getting as many Canadians vaccinated as possible, as quickly as possible, the key to that is strong and supported cities that can do all of these things and lead in the recovery and lead in the vaccination effort and provide the vital frontline services that are needed during the pandemic. This is the best way to make sure that Toronto and all municipalities, all cities and towns, rural and urban, from coast to coast to coast, can continue to respond to these unprecedented times. I look forward to today's discussion at the Toronto City Council. I hope it will be constructive and not polarizing. It is a huge achievement, a huge achievement, thanks to the efforts of a lot of people, especially city staff. I'll even mention on my own staff, Louis Savillas, for example, in my own office, has worked tirelessly on this budget, and I thank him for that. And of course, all of it under the leadership of our budget chief, uh, Gary Crawford, and our city manager and chief financial officer, both of whom have done a great job. But we've come a long way to the point where we can protect all of the city's services that you rely on and made all of the new investments that we can make in this budget. Uh, and, and to find the savings that we continue to find uh, this day, uh, all of which has been done without increasing our debt, without significantly increasing taxes. It will be suggested by some today that uh, bigger tax increases, more spending, or higher debt represent a better approach. As mayor, I will not be standing or speaking in favour of that approach because I do not believe that is the right approach to be taking in this, the most unprecedented difficult times the city has ever faced with its finances. I believe strongly that the people of Toronto trust Councillor Crawford and they trust me to find that balance which has invests as much as we can and at the same time maintains all of the city's services but also carries on with the careful financial management that made sure this city was in a position to be strong before the pandemic which is in turn meant that we could be strong during the pandemic. 
While we have undertaken many extraordinary pandemic related measures, we must also focus on charting a course which allows us to remain strong so that we can recover, so that we can be strong after the pandemic is over and continue to make extraordinary investments during the pandemic and after to make sure that this remains uh, the greatest place in the country and the greatest place in the world in which to live. And I think that is the context within which I will be entering today's budget debate. And I'm happy now to try and answer your questions. Thank you, Mayor Tory. We'll now take questions from the media. As a reminder, it's one question, one follow-up. And when you're called upon, please unmute yourself. First up, we have Jennifer Pagliaro from The Star. Go ahead. Good morning, Mayor. My first question is about the police budget. You know, as you know, most of the spending is tied up in uh, salaries and benefits, which get decided when the contracts are approved. The current contract is up in 2023, and I, I wonder whether you be willing to commit to any kind of significant change before that contract gets renegotiated. Because it seems to me that if there aren't any uh, pushes to defund the police from council itself ahead of that new contract, that there will be another multi-year contract where there can't really be any meaningful change. Well, I think we can make a lot of meaningful change uh, with the present contract in place. And I think it's a good thing that we have stability with a contract that was five years when it started. And that gives us a platform uh, upon which to embark on reforms, uh, which can involve, by the way, um, you know, the hiring of fewer police officers, if that seems appropriate. But I think more likely is that we're going to transfer uh, functions and tasks presently performed by the police, but not necessarily best performed by the police to others. And we've seen an example of that with the way in which we're proposing to deal with the uh, calls from persons in distress, which I think most people agree, including me, would be better handled overall by people who are mental health professionals as opposed to police. This will free up some police resources and either lead to slower hiring uh, or will lead to uh, other kinds of uh, reassignments or budget efficiencies that can be found. I believe very strongly that the proper way to deal with the police budget is to find better and different ways and different people to do things that the police perhaps shouldn't be doing as part of a core policing function. And to then, once you've achieved those changes, make changes to the police budget at the same time, as opposed to these kind of arbitrary random cuts that people propose uh, in policing when I'm told by a lot of neighborhoods and a lot of people, they in fact want uh, a, a, a better uh, police presence. By better, I mean both sometimes more resources, but also more of things like the neighborhood policing. So that's what I'll be standing for. I've been very consistent about that. I will continue to be consistent today and every other day. And on a uh, luxury home tax, can you just speak to where you're currently at with that? City staff have reported out on the number of homes uh, that are from the previous assessment that are valued over 2 million. That's something Councillor Layton proposed. A budget committee that was rejected, it's something uh, that uh, your own uh, affordable housing advocate has uh, supported looking into in the past. Why not uh, in introduce an additional tax rate for these luxury homes? I'll just say, speaking for myself, and I adopted the same approach when I was uh, in uh, business, uh, that you don't make big decisions that impact on the lives of people, that impact on the housing market, and that impact on a variety of things like that without the proper uh, evidence and proper uh, you know, information in front of you. And actually, there has been no information put forward about what impact this would have on the housing market, uh, what the, the facts and figures are as to this uh, kind of thing. It almost seems sometimes like people pick numbers out of the air as to how they'll go about uh, changing these kinds of things. And so I think that the proper approach is to have that work done and then come back and have an informed discussion about this as opposed to a discussion based on a motion that somebody uh, who I'm sure is very well-meaning uh, you know, has put forward just because they decided these were the right numbers or this was the right kind of public policy. So I, um, I, I'm not in a position of accepting or rejecting anything, but rather to say, let's get the information, let's do this properly, um, and uh, then we can have a good discussion at some point in time uh, about whether this is an appropriate measure at this time uh, in this market um, to do what uh, people want to see done, which is to help raise some money for affordable housing, which I'm all in favor of. There's nobody who has shown a greater commitment to affordable housing and improving our efforts in that area than me. Next up, we have Natalie Johnson from CTV. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. I'm wondering, sir, when you look at the capital budget and the new pressures that may well exist on it due to the impacts of the pandemic and the operating shortfall, can you continue to justify the massive cost of rebuilding the Eastern Gardner? 
One of the great things uh, that we do uh, in this city, when I say great, I mean, it's, 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 it's well known and it's not good, uh, is to visit and revisit and visit and revisit decisions that we made. There was a decisive decision made on the replacement of the eastern section of the Gardner uh, made several years ago. And since then, work has proceeded to, uh, on that basis of a, of, a, of a very strong decision made by the city council. If you postpone that now or, or put it back, then you're first of all going to have serious safety concerns. And secondly, what is not taken into account, because I believe some of this is motivated by what I'll call political grandstanding and a, and a desire to sort of revisit issues over and over again for political reasons, is there's a very significant cost to taking the gardener down, a very significant financial cost. And so I, I'm, I'm one of the ones that's saying that we've had enough of, of the things that have gone on in the city, whether it's revised transit projects that people have had or whether it's, uh, you know, revisiting issues over and over again. We've just got to get on with doing some of these things. We make a decision, we move forward. And I think if you look at what the budget covers in its entirety for all different things that, and you spread it over the 10 years, these kinds of investments are entirely reasonable and they're consistent with what the council decided as being by majority in the best interest of the city long term. And I, I one, more thing I'll add, one more thing I'll add. Well, that number uh, is significant in and of itself. We are also investing billions of dollars, whether it's provincial money or our money or both, uh, in transit projects to encourage people to use public transit and to, uh, to uh, leave their cars at home. But the reality is that you have to have a balanced transportation system uh, that accommodates all different kinds of users and, and, and we have to make sure it's safe. And I think the whole question of the continued safety of that uh, roadway is overlooked in all of this discussion. It can't just be left to sit there and sort of say, we'll sort it out some other day and maybe change our mind again. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious though about the effect of the pandemic. Um, obviously the decision on the Gardner was made well before we knew that COVID-19 was going to happen and uh, wreak havoc on, on the city's finances. I, I just wonder at what point you pivot on that decision because this pandemic has happened. Well, the pandemic uh, has obviously affected our short-term uh, finances, but you don't see any backing away from us in terms of all of the different capital investment that we're doing in housing, uh, in uh, other kinds of infrastructure in the city. And so we're proceeding forward and I'm proceeding forward with recommending a budget here to the city council with Councillor Crawford that is confident in the city's success going forward and confident that we need to make the investments in infrastructure and transportation and transit and water and, and the environment that we're going to make so that we can be in a position to be strong going forward. And so I don't think that the fact that the pandemic has happened, uh, it should necessitate us to make less in the way of capital investments in the city. In fact, one, one could argue that we should make more if we possibly can. And that the certain thing that we don't want to see happen is that the, uh, the failure to get the support from the other two governments leaves us in a position where we have to cut capital because we don't have uh, money from them to help us with our operating problems. So, I'm not for one for just constantly revisiting everything on the basis that it really is about politics. It's not about the pandemic at all. Those who would pretend that they're revisiting the gardener because of the pandemic are, are engaging in misleading uh, rhetoric. Um, you know, I think we made a decision. It was a decisive decision. Um, it, it has been invested in now by lots of work that's been done since, and I'm for moving forward and getting on with what council decided to do. Next up, we have Ashley Legasek from News Talk 1010. Go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, Mayor Tory, my first question for you about the budget is, what were we not able to do that you wanted to do in this budget because of the pandemic? And can you detail any layoffs that the city will undertake to help combat the situation that we're in? Well, I'll start by saying that quite literally several thousands of city employees over the course of 2020 had some impact on their employment and it differed depending on who you were. Some were redeployed, some were actually uh, had to go through a period of time where they were uh, uh, existing on uh, largely on um, federal support programs uh, and, and so on. There was hiring that was not done, uh, positions that were not filled. And that is how we were able in part uh, to, uh, to achieve the $500 million plus uh, savings in 2020 and again in 2021 was to make those kinds of decisions that unfortunately affected people because we were determined to protect services. And so I will just say that there were lots of things where we would like to have done more. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm proud of the fact that this budget invests more. I mentioned the library. 
I could talk about uh, Toronto Community Housing, where I can talk about the maintenance of the entire uh, subsidy given to the TTC, so it could maintain relatively normal operations at a time when the ridership is way below uh, normal ridership. But we're doing that because there are people who rely on the TTC to get around, uh, including our essential workers who've done such a great job for us. So again, our job is to find that balance in the most difficult budget year in the history of the city. And I think that the approach I have taken, the approach that has uh, been taken by Councillor Crawford as the leader of this whole exercise and by our city staff has done just that. It has protected services. It has avoided significant tax increases people can't afford. It has avoided running up the debt. Uh, and it has, it has made sure that we invest more in the areas of priority concern, especially for vulnerable populations. Thank you. Uh, my next question is about the two week delay to reopening that Dr. Davila is requesting. We know that seniors are the most profoundly impacted by the virus. And now that long term care residents have been vaccinated soon, that will move to other high risk age groups. Do you anticipate a different approach to handling the virus and lockdowns since those at higher highest risk will be immunized? Well, those at highest risk have been inoculated, and I think that will lead to an improved outcome. Although we'll have to continue to be very vigilant in the long term care homes because they are congregate settings where a lot of uh, frail people live together. But I think the need is just as profound today as it was yesterday, as it was a week or a month ago for other people who are not in long term care to as much as they can avoid contact with one another. So the approach hasn't changed and we're simply suggesting it shouldn't change for another couple of weeks. And that is done on the basis that there's a new factor in all of this. I'll say there's two new factors. One, the schools are open again, and we want to make sure we protect the safety of those children and the staff as much as anything else we do. And two, you've got the variants out there, which are a considerable unknown, but reason for grave concern based on what's happened in other parts of the country and in other countries in particular. And my overriding desire in all of this is to do this part of it properly and cautiously so that there is a minimal chance of another lockdown. I believe if you gave even the businesses that I know are hard hit and are frustrated uh, a choice between saying you can have a couple of more weeks of uh, restrictions now, as opposed to having on some date in May, a further lockdown where once again, we've been open and we lock things down again, they would say, no, we'll take the, the, the restrictions now if it's gonna give us a better chance of getting through this and not having another lockdown. I said yesterday, and I mean it, I want this to be the last lockdown if we can possibly achieve that. And I think most people out there agree with that. And I'm simply in a position where what I am doing is supporting our medical officer of health, who is a professional expert, who is a balanced person, who has looked at a lot of evidence from here and around the world and has made a recommendation. Rather than me saying, I wish it to be different, of course I wish it to be different. I'd love to be the bearer of good news about all of this, but I don't think we're in a good news zone right now. If our objective is to reopen safely, keep the schools open safely and avoid another shutdown. And that's where I'm coming from on this. And I will stand by that. Okay. And last we have Moman from 680. Go ahead, Moman. Yeah. <clears throat> good morning, sir. Uh, just a question about the budget. I know there's uh, the massive gap we have and you're hopeful that the uh, province and federal government will come through with funding. Uh, just a little bit about why you're so optimistic that will come through and what the timeline is in terms of when that has to happen before the city has to make some tough decisions on, on how to fill the gap on other ways. Well, I guess uh, my fundamental basis for optimism is it's just so clearly the right thing to do to produce a robust national recovery to make sure cities, including Toronto, are well supported. My second basis for optimism is that I spoke directly with the prime minister, with the finance minister, with the intergovernmental affairs minister, and with the premier about this. And I think they understand uh, that this is a problem, not of the creation of the city of Toronto or other cities. The drop in transit revenue is simply a byproduct of the pandemic and the lockdowns and so forth. And that they understand that we have no other way to make that up, um, especially in light of the fact we have to balance our budget. Um, and the third reason, I think, is that I think they understand as well that for us to cut capital, which is what we would have to do, and thereby cut back on investing in the future and investing in things like transit and climate change and so on, that they are better off to support us now in keeping the transit system going and keeping the city's finances in good shape so that we don't have to cut back on capital, which is about jobs, it's about investments in the future. And so uh, those discussions are well underway. I will be relentless. Uh, I have been relentless in the past with you know, fairly good results for the city. And I'll continue to work cooperatively with these governments to do what we have to do to make sure that uh, these financial issues are addressed and that we can be very strong in leading the country's recovery going forward. 
And so just on another topic, I, I spoke to the mayor of Pickering um, a couple of days ago as they move into the red zone. And one of the things that he is concerned about, and he flat out said, he's asking people from other parts of the GTA that are still under the stay at home order not to come to Pickering to shop there and, and use their facilities and stuff like that. And I wonder if you have a, a similar word uh, for the people of this city. We saw at Christmas time when regions around Toronto were open and we were closed that there was. We could actually measure based on phone data thousands of people who went into the other regions to do their shopping. And that was contrary to what was being advised at that time. And I think the advice here uh, remains the same, which is the more people can limit their interaction with others, the more they can limit their travel even inside the city, the more they can stay home and work from home if possible, uh, the more they can avoid socializing with anybody from outside their own household, the better because we are seeing an improvement in the COVID-19 numbers and we need that improvement to continue. But we also have out there the very real threat of these variants. And all of that is gonna be best addressed by people not being in contact with each other to the maximum extent possible. Please continue to stay home. And that is shopping trips to Pickering or anywhere else. No offense to Pickering. That's it for today. Thanks everybody. Thank you.